All right. Look, I think it's time for us to get started. So, um, Kira, Talopa, welcome everybody. It's uh, great to have you joining us for this webinar um, with the Telehealth Forum and Health Literacy New Zealand and Health Navigating New Zealand, uh, looking at um, effective communication using telehealth and um, the sort of area around health literacy. So, what are some of the ideas, tips, and learnings that we can share with each other to make this much easier and improve how we communicate with with our clients and patients and whanau? So uh, look, really delighted to have this uh, wonderful panel joining us tonight. And um, for those that don't know you and know me, I'm Janine Bycroft, I'm a GP and the Executive Director for Health Navigator Charitable Trust. And I've been really passionate around self-management and health literacy for many years. And, um, really excited about the um, sh big shift that we've seen over the last three months to telehealth. Uh, I've been wanting to see this happen for a long time, and obviously this was one of the big pushes that um, COVID has brought on all of us. Um, but there's some things that we can um, learn uh, and keep learning so that we don't just slip back to how we used to work as things have started to settle down a little bit. Right, so look, first of all, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to briefly introduce Susan and Carla, who are going to um, have a presentation for us, which will be about 25 to 30 minutes. And then we're going to have questions uh, and answers with our panellists. Um, so, first of all, I've had the great pleasure and delight of working with Carla and Susan over the last few years um, on a joint project for the Ministry of Health around self-management support for primary care. And um, look, I've always uh, so appreciate their wisdom and expertise that they bring their um, understanding around uh, health literacy and how make such a big difference to um, how effective we are actually in clinicians um, and the importance for us to really focus on how we're communicating and what we can do to be more, for that to be more effective. So um, Carla and Susan are the uh, uh, directors of Health Literacy New Zealand and have uh, done a lot of work over the years for Ministry of Health and DHBs and PHOs around health literacy. They helped develop or um, write the uh, framework, the evaluation framework for health literacy back in 2015, I think it was. Um, and one of the big things that came out of that that I've always uh, remembered is the importance of what is a health literate organisation? And so what are we doing as organisations and clinicians and providers to really address that rather than... Um, putting the onus on, on clients or people to do that. So um, I'm going to hand over to Susan and Carla and uh, they'll take it away from there. Thanks team. So now I'm going to hand over to Carla. Um, I am um, here in Taranaki right now, where I, where I hail from, and uh, some of the time I, well, I used to be up in Auckland half of the time, um, but as you'll understand, that hasn't happened for a while, uh, so I have become very used to the telehealth version of life, um, and that, or my work in health, is like this. Um, so tonight, uh, Susan and I are going to talk a little bit about building um, health literacy and building effective telehealth models. I'm going to share a presentation just once. We're going to talk uh, tonight about building effective telehealth practice and patient confidence in the telehealth format. In our um, health literacy work, um, we're doing a, a bit in primary care right now, um, helping health coaches, training health coaches. Um, that are being introduced in the primary care sector and a number of the clients they're working with are vulnerable and staying at home so telehealth um, is very uh, necessary for them right now um, and we've also done a fair amount of work with public health and outpatient um, teams that uh, are also quite reliant on telehealth uh, under all circumstances. So um, we have a background in adult learning and particularly highly contextualised, personalised and applied learning and that's often what um, communication from health professionals involves. You're helping people learn new things about their particular health situation and then apply what they know to manage their uh, health and well-being. So a key area of, work, of our work obviously is communication and what uh, works for patients um, and that's affected by the mode or method or format of the communication which in this case is telehealth um, and phone and video comms. Um, so, along with providing that overall 
um, look at what's effective. We'll be providing some tips. I'm going to look at preparation tips, um, getting started uh, and, and opening the consult with patients. And then we're going to look at some of the specific health literacy techniques that might be particularly helpful to use in telehealth. And just to reiterate what Janine was saying, just so we're all on the same page about health literacy, we are talking about skills and health knowledge that people need to manage their well-being. And right now, that might be um, understanding concepts like contagion and virus spread and pandemics and uh, being immunocompromised and how our bodies work and disease states, um, it, all while navigating a complex health system. So it's not a few people with health literacy issues, it's the information and skill needs that each of us have at different points in our lives. Um, it might be a frequent and repeated need if we face lots of challenges, or it might be a few needs um, if you're generally well. Uh, and I'd also like to just mention that health literacy, it's not about intelligence. It is like tech literacy. You can be really smart, but have limited tech literacy. You can be really smart and have high tech literacy. It's not about intelligence. It's about, as humans, we tend to learn about the things that are necessary for us to know, provided it's easy to understand and easy to use and we practice a lot or it's stuff that we're really interested in. And for most people with tech and health, we think we've got enough and we stick with that until something changes and we have to learn more. Um, and, and also similarly to tech with our health, often we're not sure what we should know um, or what questions to ask or even how to describe the problems we're having in a way that makes sense to the people trying to help us. So those are all elements of health literacy that health professionals help with. Um, and I suppose you could look at it that you are tech support for the most sophisticated tech in the world, this thing here. And unfortunately we can't throw it out and buy a new one. So, <laughs> you know, uh, fix, repair, get it going really well, that's what we're about. Um, and you are experts in the health conversations that um, you're having. In your patient-facing roles, you get to be both the clinical expert and the communication expert. And you do this every day, for instance, by looking at all those non-verbal cues that tell you how people are feeling um, and what they might be thinking despite what they might be saying. Uh, so tonight, thinking about telehealth is a newish health um, communication mode. Uh, we want to create a process that really works for patients and families and gives you the assurance that you need that the platform is effective. So these are some of the tips. I've got nine tips to look through. Um, from a health literacy and adult learning perspective, our first tip would be to encourage the use of video facilities rather than audio only appointments. Because in the same way, you seeing a rash is more helpful than hearing about it seeing all of the elements of communication, body language, expression, manner, mood, alongside words, really makes a difference to understanding each other. And I appreciate that at this stage, not all of your clients will have video access, although that's rapidly changing, one of the few silver linings of COVID. Um, but if you can encourage it and, and enable it, um, it is a, a really valuable approach. And, Alongside that, the video version also reinforces a really patient-centered approach. Because one of the interesting differences about telehealth is that it's often taking place in a person's home. And in some ways, it's like a return to home visits. You know, you're being welcomed into someone's home and into their personal space instead of them having to come to you. And that's fantastic, right? I, that's just a wonderful aspect of telehealth. And, and we'd suggest as a tip that you acknowledge that and reinforce that positive um, occurrence with the people that you're working with. So, you know, thank them for inviting them, inviting you into their space. You know, it's nice to get out of the office for a change. Whatever it is, acknowledging and reinforcing that it's a really um, good, positive thing, uh, rather than because we can't meet in person, uh, we've got to do it this way. Because this really is a great accessibility option for the future. So, um, some of the rest of the tips now are really about uh, the, the distractions, avoiding and preventing the distractions that can happen in a telehealth environment. They can happen in person too, so some of these things work there as well. 
But when it happens in a telehealth environment and a patient's attention is kind of split, it means that they're taking in less information and they're able to participate, they'll participate less in the conversation. And that, that's, that's never ideal, okay? That's, that's the opposite of what you want. So, um, some patients are like me, uh, I have every confidence that telehealth works well and I use Zoom extensively and I'd automatically choose it for convenience. But recent research in Australia shows that there is also uh, quite a big group for whom telehealth might be really ideal, but who feel less confident and need a little support and encouragement. And there are two main reasons it seems that people feel unsure, patients feel unsure about telehealth. One of them is tech confidence. So actually understanding the tech, being able to use it effectively on the day. Um, but, and others are sort of unsure or slightly sceptical about the type of care that might be possible in this different format. And it's the, it's the unfamiliar. Um, so some of that could range from really specific things about, you know, how do I get my script if, if, you're not, if I'm not there to have it handed to me? Or it could be that general sense of um, uh, being unsure, un un unease. So, and looking at tip three, um, if, if it's possible at your practice or at your organisation, offering to run practice sessions for people new to telehealth, just so they can really get familiar with the technology and have their questions answered about how it works, can be really, really helpful. But either way, whether you can do that or not, it seems to be really effective to spend longer at the start of the telehealth appointment at the discussion, building rapport, kind of spending a bit more time talking about um, what's been happening for people, getting them comfortable with this setting, going through some of the tech stuff. You might discuss privacy protections. Um, you could ask if they're using the portal um, and what they're using it for and describing maybe the process you might use and asking what concerns they have about how it all works. Sort of attending to those, uh, that unease and nervousness at the start of the process can really help bring down those levels of anxiety and help people engage in what's happening. And, and it feels much more like a, 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 a standard in person kind of encounter. Um, at a very practical level, tip five, um, you might want to suggest that people have a pen and paper beside them or some way of recording um, some of the important points from the session. Now this reinforces self-management, which is fantastic. Um, and I'm sure you've heard that uh, even from in-person visits, about 50 to 80% of what people discuss uh, during a consult is forgotten within about three days. So keeping a record of the important stuff can be really helpful. And we recommend this in face-to-face, in-person -face, uh, in work as well. Sorry. Um, but when you think about telehealth, there's actually the, the, the potential that, that I think would be really great to explore of suggesting that why don't we record this bit of the discussion? Why don't we record it so you can look back at it or you can talk about it with your family? These are the really important things, for instance, to watch out for. So um, I get that that's slightly controversial and there are all sorts of uh, issues around that, but um, it's a platform that enables some of this. So um, considering that, but, but sort of reinforcing the idea that you really are self-managing this, um, here's some ways of uh, keeping record of the important stuff. Okay, I'll just click on to the next one. So, the next one is um, a, a one that's being used quite well from what I've heard already, and that's suggesting that families or caregivers um, be involved in the virtual appointments. A and by that I mean that it might be um, a husband and wife who both want to be in on their child's consult, uh, but one's at work and one's at home. So it's, it's that kind of virtual link. And that's important from a health literacy perspective because health literacy is kind of a collective activity. It doesn't, it's not just an individual knowledge base. Um, it's something that families um, manage uh, as a team. Uh, so it might be caregivers or it might be family that uh, could be involved, but inviting that um, to happen. Uh, <laughs> tip seven, of quite a unique uh, 
aspect of video chat platforms is being able to see yourself on screen throughout the conversation. <laughs> and it is wholly unnatural. Okay, we, we do not walk around everywhere with a mirror up to our faces, or I hope we don't. And, um, and if you're, particularly if you're new to the platform, if you haven't got used to it over the last few months, um, you might be surprised, fascinated, enthralled, uh, uh, or appalled by it. Um, so either way, um, whatever platform you're using, it can be useful to have advice to help people kind of minimize that impact. So if it's Zoom, for instance, it's talking people through using speaker view so that their picture becomes minimized and yours becomes the thing that they see, or it could be um, using hiding self view, um, but not to turn off their camera because that negates all of the benefits of actually having a video call. Um, and one of the other things uh, to note with the specifics of video platforms is that the very subtle verbal feedback that you often rely on in conversation. So when a patient's talking to you, you might be in the background going, yep, yes, right, oh, that sounds hard. Making those sorts of comments, it doesn't work that well in um, a Zoom platform or a Doxy platform. Um, because only one microphone really works at a time. So if you make noises loud enough like that to be heard, it actually interrupts the speaking um, of the patient and, and sort of interrupts that. Um, so relying more on body language, nods and expressions, um, they might have to be slightly uh, bigger or more exaggerated than you might normally use because we're in 3D, this is 2D. So they can be harder to see. So keep that in mind. And the final tip is about eye contact. Um, and looking directly at the camera is difficult, but being at least front on to your screen and um, looking at uh, towards the camera suggests eye contact. And that's true in in-person visits too, but it's even more obvious with the camera when you move away from it. So if you, for instance, start taking notes while someone's speaking and you do this, it breaks every connection that you've got going uh, on this platform. And people, if people see you doing that, they'll just trail off and stop speaking. So if you're going to do that, if you need to do that, explain that that's what's happening. So it's, just give me a sec, I want to check what the test results said. Over here, get it come back, start the conversation again. You know, that, that is much better than talking or, or trying to, even though you can listen while you're turned away, it doesn't, it, that it's not what create, it, it's not created um, visually when you do it in, in a telehealth platform. So, those are some tips um, about effective communication. They'll help you to build a comfortable, um, confident uh, interaction. Um, and and get any concerns expressed. Um, you'll then be moving into the proper consult, um, or the, the and you'll be using whatever process of communication you might use in primary care. It might be Calgary, Cambridge, or the Hui model, or the double diamond, whatever it is that you use to move through exploring the purpose of the visit, setting an agenda, working on the issues, and then summarising and coming to a close. And for that. I shall pass on to Susan, who's going to talk about um, the three-step model. Let me just bring that up for health literacy. Sure enough. Thank you. Um, so the three-step model is a model that's based on adult learning um, principles, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, but we developed this for the Health Quality and Safety Commission oh, quite a while ago. Now, this last um, publication was done in 2014, and it, it's a formative process. Step one is finding out what asking and finding out what people already know. Step two is building new information on, onto their existing knowledge. And step three is checking you've been clear. So ABC. And I know that in primary care, I, I know that in health we already have an ABC, the elephant in the room, but this is, we didn't do this deliberately. It just happened. So the purpose of any engagement, um, whether it's in person or in telehealth, is effective in, in terms of effective communication is getting listening comprehension. You want comprehension. 
and that's the, when Colour referred to the research that says so much is lost after a consultation, it's that comprehension has broken down and hasn't been achieved. So this is why we start off with um, ask the first activity. Colour, can I go next slide, please? Thanks. So this is important because what you're trying to find out is what the person knows. Um, and you're trying to activate their prior knowledge because if they bring their prior knowledge into the room with them, then it makes it much easier for you to add to that prior knowledge and connect the dots. And for you, you want to know what their prior knowledge is. It's a very different conversation if they don't know very much and um, it's an equally a very different conversation if they know a lot. And one of the biggest reasons we have the step one ask is because we want to avoid assumptions. Assumptions that you make that you assume that someone knows a lot because they were diagnosed with diabetes 10 years ago or equally that they're newly diagnosed and they don't know anything about it and you, you um, assuming they don't know anything and you're um, telling them a whole lot of stuff and they've got no members who have diabetes and they actually know a lot so it's a really important thing to avoid making any sort of assumptions um, so adults learn best when they have a purpose for learning. It's relevant to them and they feel responsible for and are involved in their own learning. Um, and this is why we, we've developed this step. This is why um, we say you need to find out what they already think, know, do and believe. Um, in psychology, it's called unearthing people's schema. Um, and basically it is their prior knowledge. So how is their prior knowledge um, managed and because you're going to be adding to that prior knowledge. And you do this by having a chat, you're using open questions, um, you know, just saying, well, why do you think this might be happening? And you might start with an opening question and a good opening question, you know, for a while has been, how were you um, level four and how are you feeling about um, things now? You know, you've got lots of questions to ask. Um, what do you already know? They're up here. What have you tried before? So these sort of questions that you're going to get people to tell you things so that they're going to engage with you and share with you what they already know. Um, and they're going to share with you important things that you are going to make note of because those are the sort of things you're going to want to address. Um, you're not wasting your time because, um, you know, you are going to find out what they already know. So. As I said before, step one is formative. You're finding this out. And at the end of step one, you can acknowledge things that they already know, all the things they already know. It's great you know so much about such and such. Um, and you're doing these things. So let's deal with the particular issue you want to deal with, whatever that might be. And for some, um, I know that the people attending today, not all of them are in um, primary care settings, and I know there's some people from Plunkett and uh, registered. So it's often useful at the end of step one, at the ask step, to actually set an agenda to say, so you've told me, um, one of the things we'll do is check baby's weight and tell me how things are going with baby. And then you want to ask me some questions about starting solids. And then if we've got time, then I'd like to talk to you about some important aspects of um, baby's development over the next three months. So you set an agenda, you make it quite clear that there's going to be attention to the person's needs and then um, you've got something you want to add and then at this time there's some other things as well. So thank you Carla. Uh, oh, oh, so if you know me, um, you will know that you won't be surprised. I'm going to give an example of how you use ask and why it's important. So if you know me, you will know, not be surprised that the example I'm going to give you is about gout, because it's one of the things I happen to be, um, um, some people would say I'm obsessed by it, but not really. But anyway, so if I remember when I had my first gout attack many, many years ago, and um, what I knew about gout then was I worked in an adult learning centre in the pulp and paper mill in um, Kawano, and lots of people, men came and spent their time with their gout attacks, in our open learning center. And I learned, I learned from them that it was incredibly painful, that it seemed to be recurrent, and there didn't seem to be anything they could do about it. And they also thought that it was um, it was brought on by food, so it was a trigger. So if I'm a person coming to you about gout and you say to me, so what do you think causes your gout? And you know, I might say to you, oh, it's red meat. 
I think I'm allergic to it. You know, if I don't eat red meat, I'm okay. But, you know, it's really my fault because I had that steak last night and I bought it upon myself. It's bloody sore, but it only lasts a few days. And I know there's no long-term damage. It's a bit of a joke, really. It's not that serious. I just have to stop eating red meat and then I'm fine. You know, it's not as if I'm sick or anything. Now, that is going to tell you a lot about this person. And if the response to that person is, which was the GP's response to me in Kilmado at the mill, he actually um, said to me, well, I, I think you've got gout. He said, I can check by putting a needle in your big toe and taking off some synovial fluid. I was less than impressed about that idea. And then he said to me, and you can go on a long-term medication and um, you have to take it for the rest of your life, but you'll never have another gout attack again. And, you know, here was me thinking, I wasn't sick. I was just like these guys, you know, I just had something that had happened to me. And why would I want to take any long-term medication? Because there's no link being made between my prior knowledge and what um, the GP was telling me at the time. Um, so I think those are the reasons why I really, you really need to find out the prior knowledge and then link and tailor your approach to that. So we're going to talk about the next step now, please, Carla. Can we talk about build? Um, so in build, it's, we think health professionals actually do quite a lot of building and we think um, it happens relatively well. You know, we think that the problem is that there's not too much asking happens. And so you can either give people a whole lot of information they already know, or give them a whole lot of new information that doesn't make sense to what they already know. So that's why step one is so important. So there's lots of things that can get in the way of listening comprehension. And we talked about um, that as being the sort of aim of effective communication. And the things that can get in the way is that listening comprehension happens in real time. There's nothing for people to refer back to. It's not as if you're reading and you've got a text and then you can leave that text and go away and come back and look at that text again. You often can't get to control the rate of the speaker. So I have, mind you, I would probably, I'd probably ask someone to slow down, but most people don't feel able to say to a health professional, whoa, back that bus up and start again, please. Um, and Things can interrupt comprehension. And one of the biggest things that interrupts comprehension is language. So it's really important to um, use the language that people um, have told you in the first step. If they've said words to you that are not technically correct, you know, if they say, instead of saying they've got diarrhea, they say they've got shits or something like that, then use that word rather than introduce a new word that may cause them to try and work out what that means. So when people are trying to work out, if they hear a word that's new and they're trying to work out what it is, what happens is they stop listening. So your brain goes boing, and often if you're looking, you, using your really, if you're really up close like this, you can see people's eyes go away and they actually are using their long-term memory and trying to think, diarrhea, have I had that diarrhea? Why can't you spell that? And while they're trying to work out what that means in relation to their language, they're not hearing another word you're saying. So when they come back, um, they've lost quite a bit of information. So use their language. And you can then say, you know, another way of talking about that is saying, you know, you've got diarrhea. That's what we call it. Um, and also explain any new health terms you're using um, based on if you need to use a new health term, then use it, but explain what it means. Um, some people at um, step two, the build, draw pictures, and visuals are actually really important for people. In telehealth, um, you can still draw pictures and, you know, hold them up for people to look at um, and say, well, here's where this is and this is what we're trying to achieve. And I think, you know, during um, COVID level four, you know, um, hand therapists and um, physiotherapists still managed to use telehealth to work. So, um, that they were able to draw pictures and show people how to do things. If um, something you're doing relies on a sequence, that's a really useful way of building, is saying, right, you know, there's four steps to what I'm asking you to do. So the first thing is this, the second thing is this, the third is this, and you can even go one, two, three, four. So really reinforce that. Um, if, you know, on telehealth, you can demonstrate things like how people might do something. 
um, and then ask people to practice. So you can, they can watch you do something, you can watch them, you can give some feedback based on how they're going. Say, great, you got that first part right. Maybe if you just turn it like this, that'll be better. Um, share examples of things that you think might be helpful for them, particularly if you know um, the person and their whanau, and experiences that, you know, you told me you've done this. Well, actually, if you do something similar to this again, that will be really helpful. Or for the gout example um, might be, you tell me that um, red meat seems to um, give you gout. So but I'd just like to ask you a question that might seem a bit odd. How many people in your whanau have gout? You know, how many people, um, so, well, actually my uncle's had, my dad has. Well, did you know that um, that gout is actually runs in family? So if it runs in your family, there's a genetic component to that. And start building new information based on it. And in the gout example, it's an example where you have to sort of add new information which crowds out the old information. So it's not a question of saying you're wrong, it's a question of saying, well, I understand why you think that because that's quite, um, you know, a lot of people in New Zealand think that, and, um, but we have new information now and you can share it. Um, the, Understand what you're asking people to do, particularly if you're asking people to get lab results or to go and do something else. So make sure you follow that through and are very clear and explicit about what the instructions are. And it's an opportunity to, um, to use the patient portal if they're engaged, if you have a patient portal and they're engaged with that. Um, and to say things like, right, I'd like you to look at this. I'm going to send you a link. So whether you're going to email it to them, put it in the portal, whether you're going to text that link to them. Um, so that they are, or um, we need you to go and get your lab results. This is how you're going to do that. Be very, very explicit and clear about how that's going to happen. Um, and a way of moving from step two and step three is to actually say, at the end, most people have questions about what he would do. Most people have questions. What questions do you have? So you're not saying, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this when we come to step three, you're not saying, do you have any questions? Um, because most people don't want to say, yeah, I've got heaps, because that makes them look like they're unintelligent. You know, they don't want to do that, or it means they might have to sit there and hear it all again, and they, they're over it now, and they want to move on. So it's easier to say, most people have questions. What questions do you have? and just wait. So remember we said that the goal for um, telehealth is effective communication, and effective communication is about comprehension, yours and the person you're working with. So this step, step three, is all your responsibility. It's all about you, it's about you checking you've been clear and provided the information that Fano needed in a way that works for them. So, you could start off by saying, I just want to check I've given you the information you need. You can, there's a lot of different ways. You can say, say, I know that your daughter wasn't able to be with you today, so um, just to check I've been clear, tell me what you're going to tell your daughter when you see her. There's a range of different ways um, you can introduce this. You can also things, say things like, we've talked about three things you're going to do as a result of our conversation today. So. I want to check I've been clear, can you tell me what those things are? And as I said before, avoid the yes, no questions. Um, because again, you're going, if you say to people, do you understand? There's a dialogue goes on the person's head. Nah, haven't got a clue. But if I tell them I don't understand, they'll think I'm done. Or they'll go through it all again. Nah. It's, um, many years ago, I was in a... Um, sitting in a reception area in a primary health care and a man came out of and he went to pay and the receptionist said to him, well, how did that go? And he said, I haven't got a clue. And every fibre in my being screamed, please refer that man back to where the doctor, the health professional, the nurse, you can't see. But he said, they're going to send me a letter. And so he paid and went. I was hoping that the letter was clear. I was hoping. Okay, the rest of it, please, Carla. Oh, that's it? Oh, okay. Um, right. So the trick is here, if you're not clear, 
if it turns out the person isn't able to tell you the three things that were important for them to do, or that they have to, um, what they're going to tell their daughter when they see her again, then you need to take responsibility for it and say, sorry, I haven't been clear, let's go over that again. Or there may be a specific part that they've missed. So they may have got the, mo the gist and you think, good, I've been clear about that. And you're able to prompt them and say, so I also talked about one thing about when you're going to um, check your weight in the morning and this, when you're going to check your weight. And they go, oh yes, it's in the morning before I eat. Right, so you can prompt them for that. You really need to be specific so you're really clear that, um, that they have got um, what the comprehension, that their comprehension does match yours. Um, and by checking you've been clear, that means you check their comprehension as well. Um, if they really, um, their comprehension is not what you'd expect, then it's no point repeating exactly what you said in the first place. You've got to find a different way of doing it. And you may have to start. So at the beginning, I asked you this and you said such and such. So what I want to do is add something for that. Be much more explicit and slow down. Um, which I'm not doing at the moment, but that's the point. You, you can't just go through the same thing again because obviously that didn't work. And at the end, you might want to just check before you end your conversation is that is, what else would you like to know? So you're using that open question again. What else would you like to know? And just check that they have everything that they need. Their comprehension is complete before they leave the telehealth consultation. Now, I just no, I'm not going to do it. I was going to do an activity with a piece of paper, but I'm not going to because I've just looked at the time and it's time for us to um, answer some questions and let John and, and Lucy have an opportunity to talk. So, kia ora. Kia ora. Thanks, uh, Susan and Carla. That was great. So, um, look, we'll make the slides available if anyone would like to uh, have a copy of those afterwards. And look, we're um, really grateful to have the other panelists that have joined us. Uh, unfortunately, Martin, who was um, advertised to be with us, has got called into an urgent uh, PHO meeting tonight. So um, we had some SOS messages out and Lucy and John were um, wonderful and obliging to join us. And Ruth, Elad, you, I'm sure you will mostly uh, will know. So look, what I'm gonna do is just hand over to um, Ruth first, if you've just got to, if if you want to give just a couple of minutes of comments around telehealth and effective communication, and then uh, we'll follow with uh, Lucy and John. Thanks, Ruth. Um, yeah, sure. Kia ora katoa. Um, I'm Ruth Large. I'm a I'm an emergency physician, which I don't often get to talk about, so <laughs> I don't often get to be a panelist. Um, I'm an emergency physician and rural hospitalist, so I guess my experience with patients may be different from some of those who are, who are, who are watching. Um, so often my experience is patients um, who are already with another care provider, and I may be coming in to give another piece of information or hear some more. Um, my, my experience has been has been very much what Susan has uh, described. And thank you so much, Susan and Carla. That's really great communication pieces that you've given for us. Um, the things that I do find difficult often are sharing information um, and slowing myself down. So I, I do talk too fast and I have to keep on reminding myself to, to slow down. Um, and sometimes I will actually, if I know that I'm going into a consult, I'll even start with that. And I'll say, look, I'm really sorry, I tend to talk too fast. If there's something that you don't understand, please raise your hand and I will slow down um, because I forget. Um, and the other thing I find difficult is sharing information. So, um, and, you know, as many of you may know, I love Health Navigator, it's wonderful. So I, I have, I, if I can... Um, screen share, then I can do that. Otherwise, I'll I will be sending the link on to whoever's on the other on the other side, um, and that's probably enough for my little little couple of uh, bits. Let you move on, Janine. Oh, thank you. Uh, look, um, I'd like to next introduce Lucy. Lucy is the um, telehealth program. Um, lead at uh, ADHB, Auckland District Health Board, and has a background in nursing and has many years experience in telehealth and has pioneered this uh, over many, many years and also has a lot of um, uh, 
experience helping people set up telehealth. So if you've got technical questions, you can um, start sending questions through the chat and the um, questions forum, and we'll uh, hopefully get to those. So Lucy. Hey. Thanks very much. Um, that was really great to hear uh, from Carla and um, Susan there. Um, I would also like to uh, say the same thing that Ruth did about slowing down. I actually talk very quickly and that can get very jumbled over video. So learning to slow down is actually really hard, I think, for health professionals. We've got limited time to do things, so we tend to talk very fast. What is really important is that you have very good um, audio uh, as well as your video. So um, if you're having issues uh, with your patients um, and it's breaking up and things, sometimes it may be worth asking them to link in through the phone connection so that they can get the microphone and the speaker through the phone and they still get their visuals and you're seeing their camera uh, on screen. So separating those can help technically if you're having any issues. Um, just going back to being patient-centric and building that rapport when they first come in is actually really important. We're doing quite a bit of work currently about trying to lock in the gains of telehealth that we uh, did well, through the COVID period and running various workshops and things. And uh, what's become very apparent is that some of the things that we're starting to do from a cultural point of view in our face-to-face, -face, we can actually continue those of video conference. You know, Kara Kia, um, it, you know, for a Maori patient. Now, you may not be confident in doing it yourself, but in this environment, you could actually have it recorded and uh, easy to play uh, uh, from, from your computer. So you don't actually have to um, know exactly how to, to do it, but that might be something that is really important to the patients to get them to be more relaxed before you launch into the, the appointment. Um, video is really important and that's um, something that's very important for me. I'm actually totally deaf on one side and I'm losing hearing on the other side and I rely on what I'm seeing. So though I don't lip read with nothing, I'm actually, my brain sees what is there and it puts it together. And that's actually um, for years how I've compensated for not having full hearing. So the video part actually becomes really important. I can also see who's talking when it's multi-party. And on a telephone only call, which is multi-party, for me, it's actually hard to pick up who is actually talking. At least on video, it's usually highlighting who's talking back to me. Um, one of the other things that we talked about was, um, was mentioned before was recording. And so in Zoom, you can record the session. So as long as you've got a pro license and things, you're the host, you can either preset it to record or you can turn it on during a session. And at the end of it, you're getting an email with the links, one link that you can use to download it and keep it if you want. But the other link you can send to people that you want uh, to share that link with. And that actually could be quite important to send that to a patient whose other family members couldn't attend. And then they could use that to uh, show their um, whanau what went on in the consultation if, if they can't uh, join themselves. And the um, video and telehealth platform is really good for linking people from multiple uh, different areas um, to be able to join in. And you know, I think that's giving us a lot more opportunity. Um, talked about actually having people with you. I think that is really important. And for me and my extended family, I had a nephew with a chronic condition. They lived in the South Island, but he was managed by the Starship Hospital. 
So they would regularly have to come to Starship for visits, but not often both parents couldn't come. So in the days before we had video, I actually used to borrow a speakerphone and actually take it into the clinic room with my sister and my nephew so that um, his father could join in the conversations as well. Um, we should also think about linking in interpreters. Um, I think in many areas we actually underest underestimate how important that is for many people where English is a second language and we don't offer that as much as we could. And this is a really good platform for, to have an interpreter who doesn't have to travel and can come in on audio only if necessary. So they're not actually seeing what's going on, but they can participate and help translate. Great. Hey, thanks, Lucy. That's a, a really useful and really important points there about um, hearing and people, uh, if people got hearing, hearing issues, how the video just really enhances that uh, communication. So, yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, now, um, my great pleasure to introduce John. John Morgan is a GP based in Hamilton and has been a pioneer for the healthcare home right from the beginning. So when I first learned about it five years ago or more, John was one of the champions. Um, so look, he's been uh, working in this space for a long time. So John, over to you. Kia ora. Um, it's, thank you very much for asking me along. And that I, to be honest, I found that presentation really helpful and I've written some little snippets down that I'm going to use. So thank you, thank you. Um, and look, as Janine said, we've been um, sort of dabbling in, in virtual health for probably 10 years now um, and up till recently have been have been just using telephone because um, the technology wasn't particularly there well enough for, for, for the telehealth the video links um, and what COVID's done is it's plunged us into to using it and it's just been an absolute godsend through that period um, and I think we're, for, from my point of view, it's, it's the phone thing's great when it's my patients and I can um, pick up some cues, but when it's people I don't know, that video really comes into its own. Um, picking up the, vi the, the, the visual cues. Um, uh, and it's, like I say, it's really, really helped us over the COVID thing. And it's, I think, opened a lot of patients' eyes to the value of, being able to consult in a really um, valuable way remotely. Um, I, and, and the, especially when you want to do family meetings, um, I've got one particular instance where one of my patients relocated, he locked down with family Fano in uh, Fitianga. Um, there were some particularly uh, crunchy and quite difficult uh, clinical decisions to be made about his medication and care. And actually being able to have a, um, a really good family meeting with four of his family members to help him and to support him through quite difficult decisions um, was huge. Um, and, uh, and the key to that was um, some of that visual stuff because you could see um, Eric's response, but also the response of his family members standing behind him. Um, and so that was very cool. Um, I guess one of the learnings over the years that we've made around the virtual care is that you need to give the same the time that's needed. We'd um, rather, in a, a silly way, probably um, shoehorned telephone and virtual consults into a, into a shorter period um, and at specific times of the day. And that really did limit the usefulness for patients. And also it made it quite stressful for clinicians. Um, so actually giving yourself the time such that you can actually slow down, you can build the rapport, have, um, uh, you know, a, a, a open things up, make people feel comfortable and do that um, housekeeping at the end, checking that people know, checking that people are clear on the plan um, going forward. I'm, I must admit, I'm interested in the whole recording thing. Um, and and I, we hadn't really thought about that. Um, um, so I think we're probably going to have a chat about that <laughs> at the practice and see if that's something that we want to explore. But I guess it's the patient's consent around that and 
<clears throat> and exploring that they're comfortable and whether that would be valuable would be really key. And the other thing that I'm just sitting here thinking, actually, this is going to be a very valuable, um, I've got one patient that I saw this morning who, um, who has their power of attorney is in Australia and can't come home for, and so actually setting up a Zoom meeting um, for remote parties abroad is, is, is something that we haven't looked at, but I think that's quite exciting. I'm going to have a look at that tomorrow as well. So, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thanks, John. That's uh, some really good points there. That uh, ability to connect our whanau and have those family meetings is going to be something, as you say, we really need to explore how we're going to do that more in general practice because it's going to add so much more value to uh, people. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, thank you, everyone. We've had some questions coming through. Um, I'll just hand back to Susan and Carla, if, see if you want to uh, can answer some of those for us. Great. Thank you, Janine. Um, and thank you, uh, Lucy, John, and Ruth for the, for the additional um, examples that you gave. Look, I'd like to um, just have a quick response to the first question, which is about um, uh, our opinion on assessing health literacy and if there's a tool out there. Um, there are tools out there. Please don't use them. <laughs> because right, um, health literacy is, is very um, personalised and specific. So all the tools out there are general. So someone may have low general health literacy, but they may know a lot about their child's asthma. And that's the thing you're talking to them about. So the whole process of ask, build, check, the asking at the beginning is the personalised assessment. And you're asking them what they understand about their child's asthma. So that's much more relevant than a general assessment tool. Okay, so that's, that's the basis. And, and doing a general assessment assumes that you can do something about their general health literacy. And... You're not. You're dealing with a very specific area of their health. So we'd really, um, really recommend that the ask is the personalised assessment part, really. Anything to add to that, Susan? No, I'm just, um, I'm just looking and thinking. I, I, I've just typed an answer live. I should never do that because I have typos. Sorry, Tony Gill, there are lots more typos in my answers. So it's not that I can't spell, I can't type, as it turns out. <laughs> No, I, I agree. I think, um, yeah, I agree that I think we should keep away from assessments. They're unhelpful. So, um, somebody, so I answered Veronique's um, question about step three and just said that step three is, in fact, in the US is known as speech back and it's very well researched. Um, and but we think in um, the model, the Ask, Build, Check model, that you really need to unpick and unpack the uh, prior knowledge because people can, in teach back, and I've seen it happen because I've sat in with some sessions, they can actually say really clearly what, in teach back, what the health professionals had asked them to do. But they're not going to do it because it makes no sense to their prior knowledge. Like, why would we do that? It doesn't make sense. So, yes, I know what they told me, so go from there. Now, there was somebody who asked a question. Oh, yes. Um, has interpretation services been accessed? And um, Ruth, you talked a bit about that and tried with telehealth. And I understand it has, and I understand in that research in Australia, Carla, sometimes it was successful and sometimes it wasn't. So it was a bit of a mixed bag. Um, so I think it is a question, and it's like everything... Um, with interpreters, I think it is a question of, of ensuring that they're, they're um, organised. And But it seems to us that having an interpreter using telehealth seems to be much easier than, you know, they don't have to travel. All they have to do is get in the Zoom link. So it seems to be something that should um, work. There is some one, one of the challenges that we've experienced with interpreters, when we're running clinics, if the clinics start running over, and you've got interpreters in them, then you overrun an appointment and that interpreter's due to go into another one and join it. So they miss the second appointment or part thereof. So if you are actually running it as a clinic and it's the same interpreter, then I would suggest that you try and space it, um, particularly if you've got problems with overruns. Thank you, Lucy. That's great. Um, and I think the last one is for, from Faloi, and she said it's a bit hard when working with Pacific people. We both health literacy and language are a barrier. And I think it's, in my experience, the language is the particular barriers. Carla said before, 
um, you know, if you're, everybody has low health literacy at times. I mean, I, I know I do, um, because often, you know, it's a new, um, it's a new diagnosis, or um, I'm not feeling, I'm stressed about something, or I'm not feeling well, or I'm tired. And so my ability to engage is actually reduced. So I think um, the comments that Lucy just made about interpreting, um, I don't know, if, um, we had this question before, I think, about automated interpreting before, and Andrew, I think you said that they're working on it at the moment. Um, you know, it, it may be something that comes, but it's not um, perfect at the moment, um, the sort of automated interpreting. Ruth, did you want to add something before? I, I actually just popped it in the in the answer box there. I was just saying that um, uh, our experience has been that interpreters are often really useful on the on audio and not necessarily on video. So it can be quite good to to provide that option, and that's partly because it can protect the anonymity of the of the patient in the conversation. Um, but also, it means that you're directing your conversation to the patient because that's one of the things that can you know hinder consultation sometimes when you're just really focused on the interpreter versus the patient. So. That's a really good tip, actually. I um, will keep that in mind. Thank you. That's really useful. Um, could I add just something about the equity um, mm -hmm. questions? Um, I think uh, I, I appreciate the whole Wi-Fi uh, limitation issue, um, but I think that is improving over time. We're also thinking about are there community hubs where that could be? Is there a family member so you're together? Um, talking about health. Um, I actually think that telehealth, video telehealth in particular, is, is a real um, opportunity for equity because people don't have to take time off, you know, I don't have to take all morning off work to get to the doctor who, who is an hour away um, for a 15 minute appointment. I just need the 15 minutes, you know. Um, so, so access is improved by telehealth, um, not made harder, and access is a big equity issue. So, um, and, and you can have family involvement. That's the other health literacy thing I wanted to say. It's not just about you and your health literacy. It's a combined effort. So the more you can involve support people, including language support, um, a, 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 people will provide health literacy and help people understand their health as a, as a team. One of the other things that I'd also think of adding when we're talking about recording um, we do what's called TeleDot, which is directly observed therapy for patients that are taking tuberculosis medication. They need to be monitored uh, for six months to a year. And we were sending nurses and cars great distances, Waikoo to Wellsford. Um, we started video conferencing those, and now we actually do it as recording. So the patient has the same link um, every time, they go in, it auto records what they're doing, and the nurse just gets the link, which they can then check. So you could probably also consider for your chronic patients, setting that up where they can go on and tell you about how they're doing, show you, um, and that type of thing, rather than you having to both uh, get the same time to meet, but you could actually get um, a report back and uh, understand um, where they're at and whether you need to follow them up. Great. Hey, look, um, thank you all for those uh, excellent um, points. And there's been a couple of questions around storing of um, consultations and recordings. Uh, Lucy, have you got um, 30 seconds uh, to answer <laughs> okay. that one? <laughs> okay. Now, the, the official thing is, when you have a consultation, it's about recording the outcome. And the outcome usually gets recorded into the clinical record. You are not required to keep the video uh, at all, uh, unless you so choose. But you have to have recorded that outcome. Okay. And, and the other thing, of course, is that both parties need to have consented to anything being recorded. Yes, you, will, you always need to inform everyone that it is being recorded. But officially, uh, for audio recording, if you are party to it, you can actually record something without other members being associated, as long as you are party to it. So that's actually the, le the legal thing for the audio recordings. 
Cool. Um, I know it's certainly an area that most clinicians are not comfortable with yet. So um, there's a lot of discussion that needs to be had as we start to think about where this could be an advantage, where it's not, what's our comfort level. If we're uncomfortable, why is that? So question our own uh, issues and um, yeah, where is, but it should all be about what's best for the person what's best for the patient. Is it about them learning how to do something or to share with their whānau rather and we address our discomfort and uh, try and um, yeah, make those changes over time. Hey look, I think we better wrap it up there. Look, um, thank you all so much for joining us and um, sharing your evening with us. We hope you found this useful and have uh, picked up a few tips that you can um, take away and share with your colleagues. Um, and thank you so much to our wonderful panelists. We really appreciate your giving your time and effort and uh, being willing to step in um, for, for two of you at very, very short notice. So a uh, big thank you to you all.